Muthuswami Dikshidhar. He was the youngest of the Mumurti, the Carnatic Trinity. He was also born in Tiruvarur in the year 1775. A Sanskrit scholar, a brilliant musical mind, a widely travelled person who visited many temple towns across the length and breadth of India, a, a deeply devout person and a Sri Vidya Upasaka. Sri Vidya is, a, is an esoteric uh, discipline, esoteric worship cult and he was initiated into Sri Vidya and many of his compositions bear references to aspects of this worship. His life and his work, his musical work are strikingly different from that of Tyagaraja. If Tyagaraja lived for most of his life in the small hamlet of Tiruvayar near Tiruvarur, Dikshidhar was a widely travelled person. Though born in Tiruvarur, they, um, they, his family moved to Manali, a town near Chennai. Uh, Dikshidhar's father, Muthuswami Dikshidhar's father, Ramaswami Dikshidhar, was an erudite musician, a scholar himself and a composer of no mean merit. Um, in fact, the creation of the very, very popular raga Hamsadhwani is attributed to him. Um, Ramaswami Dikshidhar, uh, along with his three sons, all of them musically accomplished, they all moved to Manali at the behest and invitation of a patron in Manali, a Muttu Krishna Mudaliyar. Muttu Krishna Mudaliyar is said to have visited Thiruvarur and uh, being very impressed with the Dikshidhar family's musical achievements, he invited them and uh, brought them over to Manali. At Manali, Dikshidhar had varied influences. Uh, he was, of course, tutored in uh, Sanskrit and uh, also in music. He was also exposed to um, Western band music that uh, used to play at the fort there. And as we will see later, he has left behind 40 odd compositions which, um, whose tunes are derived from Western band music. While at Manali, uh, when Dikshidhar was about 15 or 16 years of age, they were visited, the family was visited by a, a yogi called Chidambaranatha Yogi. And uh, the yogi took a liking for Muthuswami Dikshidhar and uh, they grew close. And uh, he asked that Muthuswami Dikshidhar should accompany him on his uh, travel northwards. Um, knowing that it would be a great influence on a young man, his father Ramaswami Dikshidhar permitted this and uh, Muthuswami Dikshidhar travelled with Chidambaranatha Yogi and it is said that they lived in Benares, Kashi for a few years. Um, Muthuswami Dikshidhar was initiated into the Sri Vidya Upasana. He was taught various Shastras by Chidambaranatha Yogi and uh, he was also presumably he heard North Indian music at that time. Benares is also a cultural centre and uh, uh, music has thrived in this town for many centuries and um, uh, it is believable that Dikshidhar heard Hindustani music as well and uh, his compositions, some of his compositions are clearly uh, influenced by Hindustani music. They are cast in Hindustani ragas. So, um, at the end of his stay in uh, Kashi, before the yogi asked him to return, uh, legend has it that uh, he was asked to take a dip in the Ganges 
and when he came out of it he got a, he he found a, a veena um, and uh, dikshudar calls himself a vainika gayaka he was a veena player and uh, the nuances of the veena the veena uh, style is uh, very prominent in his compositions um in any case um he returned to the south and uh, after coming back he wa- he went to the holy town of tirukkani where you have a temple of a very ancient and sacred temple of lord subramanya and again lore has it that at the end of a mandala of meditation dikshida meditated for about 41 days and at the end of it an old man appeared and uh, dropped a piece of candy into dikshudar's mouth and dikshudar burst into his first ever composition this is musical lore this is legend as we have received through the oral tradition so his life was completely a different story from tyagarajas or shama shastris as we will see his compositions his musical work is also remarkably different if tyagaraja sang predominantly on shri rama dikshudar has sung on a whole pantheon of hindu deities we could say that his uh, favored uh, deity was the goddess because he was a shri vidya upasaka but um, his compositions uh, don't reflect any such bias in terms of sheer numbers possibly the number of compositions on lord vishnu rama and krishna are lesser but um, he has composed on all the deities even the navagrahas the nine planets according to hindu astrology dikshudar traveled um, all across the country and uh, he has composed a composition on the deity at badrinath on the one end and the deity at rameshwaram at the other end so that was the span of his travel um dikshudar composed almost entirely in sanskrit a few compositions of his are in manipravala manipravala is uh, where uh, there is a mixture of languages but uh, he was a sanskrit composer Tyagaraja's compositions and his musical outpourings have one abiding guiding light so to say that is to express a wide gamut of emotions so you can find in Tyagaraja's compositions a variety of uh, tala of laya of uh, moods expressed in the lyrics Dikshudar's is uh um, very sedate his compositions are extremely restrained in expression of emotion in fact you hardly find any emotional um uh, outpouring in his compositions they are grand and they are aloof um the most dikshudar will say is to his deity he will say mam ava that is protect me or pahi mam or mam rakshatu and so on all this is just a, a a supplication to protect none of the uh, beseeching tone or the cajoling tone that you find in tyagaraja or in shama shastri his comp- dikshudar's compositions uh, they are magnificent and uh, they are extremely almost they have almost have an impersonal tone about them which is also why um as i mentioned earlier uh in terms of their relationship to the bhakti movement the bhakti tradition as we understand it in the works of bhakti poets dikshudar is farthest because the emotive content in the lyrics is uh is is very very minimal the emotive content of the music is very high dikshudar 
Adikshita's compositions also follow the standard Pallavi Anupallavi Charanam structure. But um, in Thyagaraja's compositions, um, the Anupallavi, the musical setting of the Anupallavi is repeated in the uh, last couple of lines of the Charanam. Always the if the Anupallavi is of two lines, the Charanam is four or six lines or eight sometimes. Um, so the last couple of lines of a Charanam, of the Charanam in any Tyagraja composition usually has the same musical setting as the Anupallavi. Now, this is not the case in Dikshida's compositions. His Charanams have a musical life of their own and his Charanams and sometimes even the Anupallavi incorporate what is called the Madhyama Kala Sahitya. That is the, the lyrics are sung at twice the speed. So there is uh, the Anupallavi is sung at a particular speed and then there is one avartana or two avartanas of the text which is sung at twice the speed. This is a feature of so even musically his uh, compositions are um, the structurally they are quite different from uh, Tyagaraja's. Some of his compositions, well known compositions have only two sections. Pallavi they are called, sometimes it is called Anupallavi, sometimes it is called Samashti Charanam. So only uh, two sections in the, compos in the Kruti. The, we have compositions like this also. And uh, but these are those small, they are grand compositions and uh, very, very definitive compositions. So for instance, if we talk of a Raga Varali, one of the most prominent compositions in this is Mama Vimeenakshi, which is a Dikshida composition and it has only two sections, Pallavi and Charanam. Dikshida has also composed Raga Malikas. Mm. That is, uh, the composition is set in a string of ragas. Um, this very famous Chaturdasha Raga Malika, that is uh, a Raga Malika that has 14 ragas in it. Then there are a couple other Raga Malikas also. So, uh, this is uh, a broad overview of the compositional output of. Dikshidharu.